Hello, and welcome to today's 19th webinar in the E360 webinar series, How to Meet 2017-2020 Energy Regulations, brought to you by Emerson. I'm Robin Miller, and I'm your moderator today. We have a few announcements before we begin. Please note that this presentation's audio is provided by phone or through your computer sound system. You may also ask an online question at any time throughout today's presentation by clicking on the question mark icon located in the floating toolbar at the edge of your screen. We will answer questions at the conclusion of the webinar. Simply type your question into the text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default set as all panelists. There will be polling questions throughout this webinar. Please be sure to answer the questions and click the submit button at the bottom of the poll. The results from the entire audience will be shared in real time. There is a 20 second delay once the poll closes to tabulate results. If you'd like to revisit key sections of today's webinar, it will be available on demand at emersonclimate.com backslash E360 hyphen webinars approximately 24 hours after this live event. You'll also receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the recorded event. Discussing today's topic will be Ani Jayant, Marketing Manager, Food Service with Emerson, and Brian Binasek, Senior Refrigeration Engineer and Marketing Consultant, also with Emerson. The webinar will begin now. Ani? Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for participating in this uh, important webinar. You know, before I begin, I couldn't help but uh, comment that we have roughly about 250 participants um, that have expressed interest in joining this webinar, and we have it across our entire channel, con channel constituencies. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that because these regulations at the end of the day are, is impacting our entire refrigeration industry. Um, although this presentation that I'm going to share with you along with Brian Binasek is kind of OEM centric with the equipment manufacturers, I think it's really important that the other channel cons constituents eavesdrop in on this conversation to understand what kind of an impact this is going to have on them. I'm going to start off by talking, kind of giving a survey and a refrigeration landscape where these regulations fall. And then my friend Brian Binasek will take us into details as far as the technical aspects on how some of these uh, pieces of equipment are going to have to improve for the future. We have a tremendous amount of information that to cover, uh, and 40 minutes will not do it justice. So this is going to mainly kind of till the landscape, if you will, with what kind of regulational impact this is going to have on us. And we'd be more than happy to connect with you guys um, and those on the call on, on in future days to discuss the specifics. So with that, we'll kind of get started here. Uh, before I begin, I just kind of want to state the disclaimer here. Um, long story short, this is in the best of our abilities on how we've been able to translate these regulations that are coming out from the Department of Energy and the Envir Environmental Protection Agency. And I really do encourage uh, participants on this call to go ahead and, and do your own research and understanding this, but we have done our best to try to crystallize this message to something that is concise that we want to convey to you all here today. And uh, by no means is it 100% accurate, but it is as close to our understanding as possible. So let's begin with the Department of Energy. There's three significant regulations that's impacting our industry. And the first one that you see is a commercial refrigeration equipment. This regulations will impact starting on March 27th of 2017. It's measured in kilowatt hours per day. That is how these pieces of equipment um, in terms of energy draw are being measured. So for component suppliers like Emerson, it's we're challenged in understanding all these different types of equipment and our refrigeration system, which is the heart of these systems, will all change depending upon the levels of improvement needed for 33 plus classes of equipment that we have here today. In addition to uh, a cubic feet for vertical regions, we also are impacted on horizontal display cases and that's measured in total display area. On the second, we have the walk-in coolers and freezers. This 
ideally was starting to happen in June of 2017, but there was a lawsuit that was filed against uh, this regulations, which then uh, took issue with the levels of improvement required for both medium temp um, refrigerators as well as freezers, as well as the timing for all the change. That has since then been gone back to the ASRAC Working Committee, which is now pushed out in terms of levels on the low temp side, and its effective date is now going to be January of 2020. Unlike commercial refrigeration equipment and automatic commercial ice makers, the, the walk-in coolers and freezers are really measured on the refrigeration system side and what's called the AWEF, the Annualized Walk-In Energy Factor. And like I mentioned on commercial refrigeration equipment, component suppliers have the ability now to, in, to actually use what this AHRI 1250 testing standard, which comes with an actual calculator, to calculate what the AWEF value will be for these systems. And I'll go into more detail on that here shortly. And then finally, on automatic commercial ice makers, it is measured similar to commercial refrigeration equipment, and it is kilowatt hours for every 100 pounds of ice. And the variable there for these equations is in the actual harvest rate and the size of the machine that um, actually produces that ice. I can't help but talk about the Environmental Protection Agency's delisting of refrigerants in the same breath. I do want to mention that we are going to have a completely separate webinar on this uh, in the following months where we will get into more details regarding what these delistings mean throughout our entire industry, especially equipment manufacturers, service providers, and what end users need to be aware about uh, for the future. But for now, I want to preface by talking about box number one or arrow number one that you see here. We're looking at a R404A, which is a widely used refrigerant out in the market today that is going to get delisted for remote condensing units. These are typically field charged and they typically will be applied for walk-in coolers and freezers or sometimes even commercial refrigeration equipment where in fact the condensing unit is located either outside of the service area or um, in the back of the house. So for that, this is a big deal with 404A being delisted. In addition, in arrow number two that you see is for standalone. These are basically field charged uh, systems, excuse me, factory charged systems that get shipped out into the field. So that means they're leaving the equipment manufacturers already with the refrigerant. And there you can see that R404A as well as 134A is being delisted starting in January 19 as well as January 2020, depending upon uh, the medium temp less than or greater than 2200 BTU an hour. This poses significant challenges um, for our industry, not only in terms of timing, but also the choices of refrigerant that is in fact available. Um, for this audience, let me mention that R404A and 134A are characterized as A1 refrigerants. These are non-flammable refrigerants. And the whole point of the EPA in delisting these refrigerants has to do with what we call the global warming potential, the GWP. There's a national as well as international phase-down agreement to get this done. And in doing so, it's putting pressures on us, especially on new pieces of equipment where these delistings are uh, going to occur. So we've had an understanding that with these being A1s, non-flammable refrigerants, the question now becomes for equipment manufacturers on what refrigerants are they going to go to. In some of these refrigerants, they are in fact non-flammable, A1s, as well as flammables like R290, which is propane. So as you can see here, we have a couple things that we need to kind of pay attention to. So on the remote condensing unit side, we have a 404A D list, but 407A is in fact okay to use, in addition to 134A. 404A is a medium back pressure refrigerant. It is a great refrigerant in terms of performance and capacity as it relates to medium temp and low temp applications. 134A is a great refrigerant used for medium temp applications. So the alternative refrigerants that we have here are what's called R448A 
as and 449A as well as R450A and 513A. 448A is a 404A-like refrigerant that we have today. It's a medium back pressure refrigerant, and it's A1. It's non-flammable. We also have our 450A and our 513A, which are low back pressure refrigerants, great for medium temp applications. These numbers that you see, 448 and 449A, are designated by the chemical manufacturers Honeywell and DuPont, the first being Honeywell, the second being DuPont, formerly DuPont, now it's called Chemours. On the self-contained side, on the uh, factory chart systems, with 2019-2020 looming, the challenge that we are facing today as an industry is, in fact, there is no currently an A1 alternative that has been SNAP approved. And SNAP stands for the Significant New Alternatives Policy. It is an arm of the EPA that decides what refrigerants get delisted and what refrigerants get uh, approved for some of these applications. So for now, there appears to be no alternative in an A1 category, non-flammable, for a 404A-like refrigerant. But as I mentioned to you uh, a little earlier, that 450 and 513A are 134A-like refrigerants. They are, in fact, approved for medium temp refrigerators and could be, in fact, a good choice refrigerants for medium temp applications. We also have propane available that has been SNAP listed to be used. And then for propane, it is an excellent chemical to be used in some of these refrigeration applications. We get an improvements in efficiency as well as a boost in capacity. Thermodynamically speaking, it's a great refrigerant. And as you can see in this next column for the low temp side, 448A, 449A is in fact approved for freezers as well as 450 and 513. I do want to point this out because as I mentioned, we have 250 people on the call and we have contractors and design consultants, distributors, and other suppliers and wholesalers. This is a big deal as far as equipment manufacturers are concerned because at the end of the day, the service protocol in the aftermarket will in fact be impacted. And again, I don't want to dwell into any more details on this. We will have a specific webinars talking about these refrigerants, alternatives, thermodynamic properties, and what changes it's going to cause for equipment in the next couple months. The biggest challenge we have facing as an industry that end users and others need to be aware about is the fact that equipment manufacturers are really pressed to meet these regulations that you see on this page in a relatively short period of time. You know, we've had We've had regulations in the past for Department of Energy when it comes to commercial refrigeration equipment. We've had them in 2010. We've had them in 2012. However, really, I would like to point out that those were almost a way for the Department of Energy, which, by the way, we're using the consulting arm of Navigant in order to really understand what's out there in the installed base and now the levels at which the improvements are required are significant and posing challenges to equipment manufacturers. Not only that, we've also been through refrigerant transitions in the past from R12 to 22 to 404, the timing of which these two regulations are impacting our industry are pretty unprecedented. So that is why we are doing these webinars and bringing in all the channel constituents all together to understand how they need to prepare in order to meet these regulations. And not only that, but cross-pollinate in understanding and tempering expectations for the future, because at the end of the day, the end users will be taking on these new pieces of equipment and will have to be mindful that is one DOE regulated and acceptable, as well as it's using the right type of refrigerant that is uh, not delisted. Tremendous amount of challenges. As I mentioned on walk-in coolers and freezers, that happens January 1st, 2018. The first uh, EPA happens, excuse me, the DOE happens on March 27, 2017, followed by the EPA in January of 2018, and then followed by another round of uh, DOE regulations for ice machines. A lot of things happening here. And uh, we are uh, definitely committed in providing support as well as guidance, and we're encouraging everyone, all those people on this call, to collaborate. 
Emerson kind of took an internal survey. I was interested in seeing what our equipment manufacturers on where their head is in terms of meeting these uh, EPA and Department of Energy guidelines. And I, we asked the questions, do you have an EPA plan in place or do you have a DOE plan in place? And the results are somewhat statistic, not only statistically significant, but also a little alarming to me, with 25% of the constituents saying that there is no current DOE plan in place, especially on commercial refrigeration equipment on regions self-contained regions where, in fact, you have less than six months to be ready to comply. If you can imagine being an equipment manufacturer with the amount of lab testing and the battery of testing that you need to do in order to be compliant, it's staggering. When it comes to the NSF testing, which is talking about food safety, on UL testing, which is talking about the actual electrical safety and fire hazards, um, as well as the DOE testing needed on kilowatt hours to draw tremendous amount of challenges that our OEMs are being faced today. In addition, seeing that there is about half of the constituents saying that there is some kind of an EPA plan in place is still, in my mind, good, but not good enough. So then we ask the question well, to these OEMs on how do you envision to meet these regulations? What does it take and what's it going to take from you in order to meet it? Well, overwhelmingly, we are currently seeing a, uh, an uptick in terms of lab testing, as I mentioned about the battery of testing that these OEMs will be doing. 62% are lab testing to prepare for the regs, mm -hmm. and the remaining two and five are not. Some of these OEMs are going to be pressed for lab time and resources and money in order to get all of these done at the same time, as well as making sure they're compliant. As I mentioned earlier, and the whole point of this conversation and this webinar is to bring these channel constituents all into one sitting, if you will, to understand how to temper expectations and have an understanding of these regulations. Overwhelmingly, 87% are saying that they have to communicate this better to the end user. That's the whole point of this webinar, if you will, is to make sure that our end users understand what's about to impact them in the future, as well as the different channel dynamics on commercial refrigeration equipments from the dealer networks, even then walk-in coolers and freezers where it's primarily a contractor sale. And then they have to be mindful that these systems have to be, in fact, AWF rated in order for it to go out in the field. Guidance is being seeked from uh, equipment component manufacturers, many of them, including refrigeration companies, uh, compressor companies like us. And we're definitely trying our best in terms of this E360 forum and these webinars to provide that guidance. We also asked the questions, what do you think will, will change in terms of the product mix and the lineup? Well, 77% expected that some comp components will change. And some products will not, in fact, require any improvements. And some products are not even worth their level of improvement. Therefore, it will, in fact, be obsoleted. Costs are going to increase. That is overwhelming. And that should not come to a surprise any time there are regulatory pressures being faced in private industry. This is something that we are, we've been communicating and working with our equipment manufacturers in order to cost effectively meet these regulations in a timely fashion. Let's start talking about commercial refrigeration equipment. There's more than 33 classes of equipment that these regulations impact. They start off by they, meaning the Department of Energy and classifying these equipment, start off by saying, is it a commercial refrigerator or is it a freezer? Is it with or without solid or transparent doors? Is it a self-contained condenser unit, meaning the condenser unit is either top-mounted on the system, or in fact, is it remote condensing where the condenser unit is located out of the service area? Followed by what is the architecture of the system? Is it a vertical, semi-vertical, horizontal, or an over-counter or an under-counter system? And of course, is it a low-temp freezer or is it a medium-temp refrigerator. I do want to point out that there are certain classes of equipment where, in fact, the Department of Energy has not regulated a kilowatt-hour mandate. 
Therefore, its buffet tables, salad bars, prep tables are not affected, but it really depends on the architecture and the sharing of that condensing unit that I will show here shortly. This was an actual chart from the, the Department of Energy in one of their webinars where they talked about these costs of equipment not affected. We dug in a little bit more to really understand what is that architecture about. In some of these equipment that many of you are familiar with, there is, in fact, a top rail, similar to what you see in a salad bar and a buffet table, where it's kind of open. And then you have a bottom storage area where a condensed unit is um, providing cooling capacity for some more storage. So if you have a system where there, in fact, the top rail is not sharing or having its own condensing unit, but the bottom storage is, this would almost be classified as an undercounter, and there isn't, in fact, a test procedure for it. Therefore, this, this system is, in fact, regulated. Then you go to the next one where if you have some kind of cooling capacity that is and, and a heat exchanger on your top rail that is independent and separate from the bottom storage area, this could almost be considered as an open display case that has a DOE test procedure, therefore that can be tested. And then this bottom one as well, it would be classified as an undercounter. That is regulated. Then you have systems where you have one condensing unit that is sharing the heat exchange and is in cycling between the top rail and the bottom storage. And the key criteria here is the effect of the solenoid valve. The solenoid valve is what allows the distribution of heat exchange between the top rail and bottom storage, depending upon a control circuit that will measure what the runtime would be on the top rail and the bottom storage. If that is the case, there's a test procedure for that. That will be regulated. It's for these systems where you have a condensing unit sharing on the top and the bottom, but no solenoid valve, there is no test procedure on run times, and there is no clear understanding on how, in fact, you would regulate how much of that cooling capacity is being shared between the top rail and bottom storage. Therefore, it's not regulated. I can tell you that there's a lot of systems out there in the installed base that end users would be aware about and service providers would be uh, aware about as well, where, in fact, that is, in fact, the case. You are exempt from this regulations. You do nothing about it. I do want to talk about the equations, and I want to talk about how, in fact, these equations are laid out. The Department of Energy, or Navigant in this sense, has basically taken, as I mentioned, 33 classes of equipment. I've taken an example of one. This happens to be a vertical, closed, transparent door, self-contained, low-temp application. They have taken all, and then the x-axis here is in, volu is in volume in cubic feet, and then this y-axis that you see here is in kilowatt hours of energy. So they did a scatter plot on the installed base of where all these systems fall in terms of the size as well as what the energy draws, and a line was drawn across. Now, a best fit line on the scatter plot follows the format of Y equals MX plus B, where B is your Y intercept that is on those kilowatt hours. The Department of Energy then looked at what the what the energy draw as an aggregate for all these systems, and they basically drew another line that follows in parallel or with a slightly different slope, and that becomes your new equation that you apply to these pieces of applications. What I can tell you on this chart that you see over here is basically I looked at these 33 plus classes of equipment and I wanted to compare what previous regulations were in terms of these equations and I wanted to analyze how much does that y-intercept change. As I mentioned, a y-intercept changing would, would just basically right off the top tell you where the new baseline energy draws would begin. What I can tell you is on the vertical opens, a lot of these open display cases, horizontal deli cases, the equations we've had in 2012 and 2017 now don't change that much because the y-intercepts continue to be the same. Here in this case, it's 4.07, and then here it's also 4.07 with a slight decrease in the slope. So if there, if, so for what is the implications that's going to have on the installed base and this industry is basically if there are open display cases, deli cases, if you're meeting, if they're, uh, if these applications are meeting 2012 regulations, not a whole lot needs to change for 2017. The true test is really on these vertical guys. So that you see here, these vertical closed 
It's transparent and solid door, self-contained, low temp and medium temp is where the drastic amount of energy reduction will be required. These are the pieces of equipment that end users need to be paying attention to for the future and, it, and, and levels of improvement required to meet them can sometimes uh, be drastic. So I wanted to compare basically those equations from self, uh, these four verticals uh, that you see over here. I wanted to understand how much does that y-intercept change, which is a clear indication of how much energy would be required to improve. And what I found is that basically this is DOE data illustrated that improvement reduces relatively for larger size equipment for these vertical closed transparent or self-contained medium temp. You can see that the smaller you go, the more energy improvement will be required. As you follow that curve down, the larger systems will require relatively smaller levels of improvement, but at the end of the day, that's still 31% of improvement. Now, on vertical closed solid, self-contained low, low temp, as well as um, medium temp and transparent doors, this is where on smaller pieces of equipment, it actually improves in energy required to meet it as you go up in sizes. This is something to be mindful about, especially for end users and dealer networks as they start looking at pieces of equipment and what some implications are going to be in meeting these regulations. Let's move on to walk-in coolers and freezers. Here's how the stack up looks like when it comes to uh, the classes of equipment. On a multiplex system, this is basically almost like a parallel rack system. And it's basically a walk-in cooler or freezer or freezers that will be connected to a, a, a rack system, a multi-compressor rack system, similar to what we see in supermarkets. But a lot of the installed base is in this dedicated condensing unit where there's an actual specific one-to-one -one ratio with a condensed unit that is located on the outside of the service area of the walk-in cooler or freezers. Starts with, is it dedicated condensing? Is it a medium temp or a low temp? Is the condensing unit located indoor or outdoor? And the classification of is it less than or greater than 9,000 BTU an hour in cooling capacity? This regulation actually takes it a step further and looks at it in terms of the compression technology required. Reciprocating hermetic is a compressor, a semi-hermetic. Reciprocating is another type of compressor, as well as scroll compression technology that will be used for this. And each one of these, depending upon what type of system that is in uh, the architecture lays, will actually have an AWEF value uh, placed to it. I do want to point out that this is DOE data illustrated for walk-in coolers and freezers. And a word of caution is, this is DOE data illustrated for walk-in coolers and freezers. I do not believe that this is an accurate representation of the actual market itself, but I do want to point out this is how the Department of Energy is expecting to see costs to improve and costs to increase in order to improve these systems. You can see that on, this, on the first one, which is the baseline costs, about $3,269. And as I mentioned, here is your low temp, here is your medium temp dedicated condensing, and here's in terms of uh, capacities in 6,000 BTU, 9,000 BTU, 54,000, 72,000 BTU. And actually down here are the actual technologies in, in compression, hermetics, scroll, semi-hermetic, and an aggregate of $3,269. Going forward on what the future Basically, they, the Department of Energy has done their own calculations in order to meet this. And what they found is that you can see that in order to meet the new AWEF standards for not only the condensing unit, but the unit cooler and the system as a whole, you're looking at a 43% rise in costs. And what is also alarming is the fact that there's technology uh, drop-offs. So where you had sometimes hermetic refrigeration involved, you will not be able to meet AWF. In fact, you would have to improve your compression technology to something that is more efficient. Is this gospel? I doubt it. But this is somewhat of an indication of how the Department of Energy is thinking about how we need to go about in improving this. And cost effectiveness is what is key. 
and from some of these big manufacturers, it's a tremendous amount of challenges in order to meet these regulations. Finally, the last overview is on automatic commercial ice makers. You can see that there's two different classes of equipment. You have batch machines, which are known as cubers. This is where the ice actually freezes on a, on a plate and through a hot gas, deep, uh, hot gas defrost method straight from the compressor, you melt the ice a little bit off the plate and gravity forces it to fall. Then you have also what are continuous ice machines, which actually as the ice is being frozen, there's an auger motor at the top that is scraping the ice off the top and then feeding it to some kind of a dispensing bin. Both of these types of equipment are in fact uh, affected by regulations, but I do want to point out, as you see down here, that frozen carbonated beverage machines are not affected. I also want to point out for automatic commercial ice makers on the EPA front, they are not subject right now, as of today, to an EPA delisting, but in fact, propane is available, has been SNAP listed in order to use this. So therefore, unless these ice machines are connected to some kind of a parallel rack system, they are not impacted by the EPA regulations. So I'm going to pause and ask this group to answer the following question that I think would be important to understand. What is this audience's level of understanding? Channel, uh, hang on, I got this thing coming in the way here. What is this audience's level of understanding, channel, channel constituent collaboration, and preparedness to address these regulatory challenges? And the choices that you have here is A, didn't even know about this, B, haven't started engaging the channel and getting prepared, C, getting prepared to engage the channel now, and then D, I'm ready and have communicated to all stakeholders in my channel on these level of engagements. Okay. Looks like, as you guys can see from the, from the results of this polling question, that answer C with 47% is we're getting prepared to engage the channel now. 12% saying I'm, our, I'm ready and have communicated to all stakeholders in my channel. But we also have A and B, which is, again, a challenge to making sure that these levels of challenges are being communicated. It is something to think about going forward. And uh, Emerson implores this audience to all collaborate better, and we can certainly help in that. And I'm now going to turn it over to Brian Binasek, who will talk about the actual specifics on meeting these challenges. Thanks, Ani. I'm going to cover the uh, design options that equipment manufacturers are uh, using or considering to meet the regulations that Ani described. Um, if you look at that image on the left, that's a, a typical uh, region merchandiser, beverage merchandiser, and it's energy is rated in terms of kilowatt hours per day. Everything that's within that, the compressor, the lighting, the fans, the controls, every component that consumes energy, uh, anything that comes through the cord is, is measured and it's, it's rated in terms of um, it, uh, the unit is tested in a fixed ambient and uh, we, you know, with certain prescribed door openings uh, per the test standard. And then it's certified in the DOE database, which we'll talk about you know, to, to the public, uh, what the energy consumption of that unit is. The uh, chart on the right, the payback chart on the right there, uh, comes from a, a DOE study in conjunction with AD Little uh, that's been around for a while, where across the bottom is shown uh, the percentage of energy savings at the system level for different um, t d design options that are available. And in this example, we're showing a uh, solid door region refrigerator. This picture looked different really for every configuration, whether it's a refrigerator or freezer, and as Ani described, there's different, you know, classes with doors or, or being opened. Up the left side is the, um, in this analysis or this study, it was the uh, cost adder that the equipment manufacturer would have to add. And so the trick here is equipment manufacturers are looking for the uh, design options that are going to give them the biggest bang for the buck in terms of energy savings. And in study after study, uh, you can see the high-efficiency compressor comes out as being the number one design option that gives you the most energy savings for the least added applied cost. Other options, depending on, again, on the configuration of the piece of commercial refrigeration equipment, lighting, controls, can also have a really good payback, uh, different things you can do with your evaporator fan motors. All of these design options are being considered by the equipment manufacturers. It's just really a matter of how much energy savings they need to get and, and how much they're willing to pay for it. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, 
a lot of people think that equipment manufacturers would go right to insulation, you know, better insulation, thicker insulation, uh, in order to reduce their heat load and reduce their cost. And as this study shows, uh, that can be an expensive design option that doesn't get you the most bang for the buck. But as you'll see, you know, these days with the very aggressive um, efficiency levels that are going to be required, you know, now and into the future, equipment manufacturers really do have to consider every design option. The, um, the DOE 2017 compliance that Ani talked about for March 2017 can be very challenging, um, especially for uh, self-contained uh, reach-in equipment that has doors. Let me give you one example. A very typical uh, 24 cubic foot solid door refrigerator, similar to what we were talking about in that last slide, 24 cubic foot one door refrigerator, um, today it has to consume 4.44 kilowatt hours per day or less uh, to meet the minimum federal efficiency levels. If it consumes more power than that, uh, it cannot be legally sold in the United States. In less than six months, March 2017, that 4.44 drops down to 2.56 kilowatt hours per day. Now that means that a refrigerator that just today barely meets the federal minimum level needs a 42% energy improvement just to meet the new minimum efficiency levels. Uh, and that, that, is, that requires um, some major design work in consideration of those design options that we just talked about. I also want to mention Energy Star. Uh, Energy Star is still very relevant and continues to follow the DOE to, to promote higher efficiency levels. The, the Energy Star uh, March 2017 um, requirement is uh, 1.89 kilowatt hours per day, which is 26% lower than the new federal minimum. So you could see as we go through time and try to get to these lower levels, it's going to have to, you know, require OEMs to consider more and more technology design options just to meet the efficiency levels. Now, Ani talked about, you know, the phase down of certain high GWP refrigerants. And for uh, self-contained reach-in equipment, you know, 404A and R134A are, are two very common HFC refrigerants used today. Uh, you know, by 2020, those will be uh, phased out for these applications, and equipment manufacturers will have to look at options. Um, we, we mentioned R290 propane as a possible refrigerant uh, uh, for some of these applications. It's not perfect. It's a good refrigerant, but it's not perfect for every application. There's a new class of A2L um, mildly flammable refrigerants, which we'll be talking about in more detail at the next webinar. So as I said, you know, for, for reach-ins and meeting the efficiency levels, it really requires uh, multiple design options. You have to look for efficient compressors that have to be bundled in efficient condensing units to get the most out of the compressors. Certainly, uh, you know, fan motors, looking at ECM fan motors is, is an important design consideration. And all of the controls that are, are wrapped around these units, anti-sweat control, defrost control, how you manage your condensate, all will play a big part in, in meeting those efficiency levels. And as I already mentioned, you know, future refrigerant planning, uh, some of these refrigerant options uh, can, can often uh, bump up efficiency, you know, in a properly designed system. And if all of those options don't get you where you need to be, that's where you really need to start looking at how you minimize your heat load, how heat is getting into the box. Uh, so that's, you know, what the OEMs have to consider. And if you look at how many different uh, regions are being manufactured and how many are on the market, uh, the, the, the OEM's job is a pretty big deal to engineer, to test, and to rate each of these models. Um, and I don't want to forget the end user. We have a lot of end users listening in on this call. The energy ratings that we're talking about for these pieces of equipment are pretty much what you can expect, you know, a typical operation from these pieces of equipment when they arrive at your facility new from the factory. But it's really important uh, to maintain energy efficiency that you – uh, provide, you know, you perform the routine maintenance on this equipment, you clean the coils as prescribed by the equipment manufacturers, that will not only continue to maintain the energy efficiency of the equipment, but it will also prolong the life of your uh, food service equipment. That's all I wanted to say at this time about CRE or, or region. B briefly on walking coolers and freezers, as many of you know, there have been prescriptive standards from the Department of Energy in place since 2009 for walk-ins, things like uh, evaporator fan motors, controls, insulation, things that had to go into the construction of the walk-in. This AWEF that we're talking about, it, it's a new performance standard 
and it applies to condensing units, it applies to unit coolers or evaporators, uh, panels and doors. And the, the minimum efficiency levels are different requirements for medium temp coolers or low temp freezers, and depending on whether the condensing units are located indoors or, or sometimes are located outdoors. The graphic there comes from the Department of Energy, and it shows graphically all of the inputs that go into this AWF calculation. And there's a lot of them. Um, the, the equipment manufacturers are working now uh, to figure out where they are, what improvements need to be made. Uh, sometimes uh, these uh, AWFs can be uh, simulated or are constructed with a model. Not, not everything has to be tested. But let me tell you where we are. Um, Ani mentioned the ASRAC working group coming to a consensus agreement. Um, everything is not 100% finalized with the Department of Energy. They held uh, two public meetings back in September, got a lot of new stakeholder uh, input, and I would say things are moving forward. Um, there is a comment period, a comment period open uh, with the Department of Energy right now until November 4th, and there will be public comments posted. Uh, from equipment manufacturers, from industry advocates, so you can you can look those up. There's still some open issues or questions about things such as labeling and test procedures, uh, defrost and timing. So a couple things to be worked out, but I would categorize it uh, that we are moving forward. This uh, this colorful graphic here comes from the Department of Energy, and it shows a lot of the design options that were evaluated uh, to meet uh, AWEF for walk-in. I want to drill down on one of them, and that's the first one, floating head pressure. May, may, many of you may not be familiar with this, but I get asked a lot uh, from, from people who are involved with walk-ins, why am I seeing a transition from hermetic reciprocating compressors to scroll compressors? Well, part of it has to do with the inherent efficiency of the compressor and being able to move to a common platform for low temp and medium temp. Um, and also the, the, you know, the coming on of new refrigerants and, uh, and how scroll can handle those. But one of the over overlooked important things about scroll compressors is the ability to float the head pressure down. Let me explain to you uh, what that means in this chart. Um, I also want to mention that uh, as part of the E360 program, there is a whole webinar that we did in 2013 that's available right now on the Emerson Climate E360 website if you want to learn more about this. This is just one chart from that webinar. And let me set this up for you. The, the chart shows the ambient temperature uh, variation during uh, one day in September in Ohio, I think was used as the example here. Uh, the ambient temperature is that dotted blue line. Most, or I should say many um, outdoor uh, condensing units are set up or designed so that the uh, head pressure, the condensing pressure is fixed. And that's what that uh, dotted green line at the top. 100 degrees Fahrenheit saturated condensing is, is very typical. Um, so that even when the temperature and the ambient temperature drops very low, the, the head pressure is set up there very high. What we're advocating is, as, an, as a major energy saving measure, is looking at floating that head pressure down, taking advantage of lower ambient temperature fluctuations. The, um, the 15 degrees uh, Fahrenheit temperature difference in between ambient and the saturated condensing of the um, condenser is, is very typical, and that shaded region shows that there's energy-saving opportunities. And these energy-saving opportunities really exist in a lot of locations, not just in the northern uh, climates, but even in Atlanta, for example, or in the de desert regions where at night temperatures can get quite cool. There are a lot of energy-saving opportunities. And let me quantify that for you. This is a couple of screenshots of a um, calculator tool that's available for free download from emersonclimate.com. But it shows for a freezer, minus 20 degree evaporator freezer, the difference in capacity and efficiency if you run 110 degree Fahrenheit condensing temperature or if you drop it down to 60 degrees. And I pick 60 degrees because in many of these locations, over half of the, the hours in the year uh, do fall below 60 degrees condensing. And in this example, this calculation for this compressor, uh, when you take advantage of that lower uh, condensing, you not only get a lot more capacity, 62% more capacity out of the refrigeration system, but because the refrigeration system is not working as hard to move the heat, uh, you're actually doubling the energy efficiency ratio or the EER of the compressor. And you can download that full for free and try that out for yourself and see what kind of savings can be had just by uh, floating the head pressure. So to learn more about that, you know, check with E360. Uh, finally, ice makers. I wanted to talk briefly about automatic commercial ice makers to understand the cycle. 
Ani talked about batch versus continuous. And different design options can apply to either batch or continuous machines, and they're shown there on the right. Um, the, the left graphic, though, I want to touch on this real quickly. This shows the conditions that the compressor in an ice machine, in a, in a batch ice machine, exhibits during the ice making cycle. It starts at the start of the cycle when warm water is brought into an ice machine. Uh, the, the compressor is typically running at 30 degrees Fahrenheit evaporator temperature, and if the machine's sitting in a 90 degree ambient, uh, which is where we test these ice machines for rating them, uh, you'll typically see a condensing temperature, saturated condensing temperature of 110 degrees. Very quickly, though, the water gets cooled down in the machine, and you begin to stabilize and start freezing that ice. You build up ice on your freeze plate. And for, for the vast majority of a batch cycle, uh, you are, you're running at 15 degrees and 115 degrees condensing. And really, that's the point where the, the efficiency of the, the system, the efficiency of the compressor really plays a big part because the, your ice making takes up about 70% of the cycle. The trick there is to get into the harvest, finish, finish building up your ice, get into a harvest, harvest that ice, get back into the freeze cycle, and all of these design options here, you know, can, can help with that as, as the equipment manufacturers know. This chart here shows uh, is it the results of a survey that Emerson did to equipment manufacturers for, for all these equipment classes that we've been discussing today. Walk-ins, reach-ins, ice, even the frozen carbonated beverage and soft serve, uh, even though they don't have um, – uh, Department of Energy efficiency requirements right now. Uh, equipment manufacturers, you know, are working to make that equipment more efficient. And this chart, this survey also included uh, supermarket racks or parallel systems, larger parallel systems. And you could see all of these design options that we've been talking about, switching to more efficient fan motors and efficient compressors and lighting and controls. Uh, the, 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 the numbers of equipment manufacturers who are looking at those and considering and saying to us, hey, these are the top energy efficiency improvements that we think are going to provide the best return on investment. Equipment manufacturers are always looking for the best bang for the buck, and that's part of why we're educating not only equipment manufacturers but end users to explain why you're going to start, you know, maybe seeing more expensive equipment, but why you're going to start seeing these advanced design options, you know, appearing in all types of equipment. Finally, we've mentioned several times the Department of Energy database, the, the CCMS, the Compliance Certification Management System. It is a public database. You've got the link there. Anybody can go in there. You don't even have to register. You can look at equipment and how it's rated, who manufactures it, and, you know, how much work that they might have to do to get ready for 2017 or 2020. Right now, there's almost 38,000 uh, reach-in and commercial refrigeration models listed in there. Uh, there's uh, about 800 uh, ice, uh, commercial ice machines. And for walk-in coolers and freezers, um, uh, this, this is not the AWEF yet. This, is, this has to do with the prescriptive requirements that I talked about, uh, what type of fan motors are you, you're using and things like that. But very soon, uh, equipment manufacturers will be able to start loading up their AWEF values, and you'll be able to look and see where they are. Uh, DOE will go in here. And they will, uh, you know, pick off equipment, test to have it tested. There have been fines imposed, and that's public information that you can look and see, you know, where, where fines have been imposed for either equipment that's not listed or equipment that doesn't meet its, its, where it's rated at. Um, and, again, this is an annual process that equipment manufacturers have to go through uh, to submit their information. Now, it's not... Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, you see, oh, 37,000, you know, regions listed, and they have to be recertified every year. That doesn't mean every single basic model needs to be retested every year. Um, very often, equipment manufacturers use alternative efficiency determination methods. The Department of Energy does allow equipment manufacturers to use um, models to, uh, to rate their equipment, as long as they can defend, you know, what they're publishing, uh, you know, that, that, that is acceptable. So we have one more uh, poll question, and it's very simple, negative or positive. In what way would you describe these regulatory challenges? So if you would please respond to that. Okay. Two-thirds say it's positive. It's going to help me differentiate and lead. That pretty much uh, wraps it up. We're open for questions, Robin. Okay, so the question and answer portion will now begin. 
Um, as a quick reminder to participate in the Q&A, click on the question mark icon located in the floating toolbar at the edge of your screen and type your question into the text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default set to all panelists. We have had a lot of questions come in, gentlemen. Brian, I think this one's probably um, for you. What are the most common improvement levers OEMs will need to pull to meet these DOE regulations? Well, you know, in my portion of the presentation, which you'll be able to download, we did touch on the major levels for each class of equipment. Um, but I would say, you know, in general, uh, looking for efficient compressors that are bundled in the most efficient compress uh, con condensing units, uh, looking at your fan motors, and, uh, um, you know, any, any controls. Controls are going to be a big issue. Uh, it, the levers you're going to pull are going to be different for every piece of equipment, depending on where you are, how, how much improvement that you need. And, and Emerson Climate is always open for consultation. Uh, you can contact our design services network group if you have further questions about whether a piece of equipment is, you know, falls under these regulations and what things you might uh, want to do to to meet the future energy or refrigerant recommendations. Yeah, I, I would add to that that you know you look at if you look at a typical system and you look at the 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 engine block of the system, which is our refrigeration unit, uh, that consumes about 60% of the energy in the system. So if there's any kind of improvement, bang for the buck, if you will, it is the understanding the relationship between the compressor and the condenser coil sizing and combination. Typically, we've seen where condenser coils, that's the actual coil that heat exchange happens, um, are usually undersized. And the compressor has to run a, a, a long period of time. It might have like a 100% duty cycle or a 90 percent duty cycle well that has to happen because in order you need to achieve that cooling capacity but sizing your condenser coil a little bigger than what you have now you're able to hit the cooling capacity that you need and your runtime of your compressor goes down sometimes up to 30 40 percent but again every system is different but understanding that key dynamic between what is that compressor and condenser coil combination is where you could have a big significant impact on the total energy of the system. Okay, I think I have another one for you, Brian. Um, what are the um, advantages and limitations of propane? Okay, we touched on propane, and we were mainly discussing uh, small self-contained refrigeration systems and in the future ice machines. Um, there are R290, uh, there are 290 pieces of equipment, propane pieces of equipment on the market today. And as Ani mentioned, terrific refrigerant, good thermodynamic properties, you know, very efficient, um, but there are some limitations. Uh, one of the major ones is the uh, amount of refrigerant charge in self-contained system. It's limited to 150 grams, which is about 5.3 ounces of refrigerant, uh, which can be good. Uh, for, you know, refrigeration systems up to about one half of a horsepower. Um, but beyond that, it's, it's very challenging to use, uh, uh, you know, to get the refrigeration effect that you need with less than that amount of refrigerant. Equipment manufacturers are having to invest in some infrastructure, such as charging stations. They're having to look at their designs, uh, especially evaluating what sort of expansion device they're going to use. And there are um, service and safety considerations um, that are detailed about uh, how things have to be labeled. You'll see, in, if you look inside these systems, you'll see there's some red tube and certain, you know, uh, components that help to um, minimize any any risk of, you know, explosion or anything like that. So uh, it's coming. R, you know, R290 is coming for some. I, I think the things. biggest concern is on the aftermarket, on the service side of this. I mean, it's, it's one thing for to have these pieces of equipment charged with propane. And, and by the way, you, you, some propane, one of the nice properties of that, not only thermodynamically speaking, but you don't need as much charge in terms of the actual system. But it's on the aftermarket side. And who, how are we going to have qualified technicians tra trained to go service these pieces of applications that are charged with propane? Normally, some technicians would go out on the, on the field and take a brazing torch and then basically cut line sets. I, I can't imagine you'd be able to do that when an actual system is being charged with propane. It's not that we're, it's it's definitely a wave that is coming, and we have to catch up to it in terms of on the aftermarket service side and making sure we can properly service this. But once that happens, I think this will take off. Okay. Is it expected that R448 and R449 will be SNAP approved for medium temp? 
Yeah, all likelihood, but we've had two rounds of new SNAP listing as recent as the beginning of October, where we were expecting to see 448A getting SNAP approved. That did not happen again, um, when in fact other refrigerants were SNAP listed and okay to use. Uh, the choices are, 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 are there, but they're not in the medium back pressure refrigerants as far as an A1 alternative is concerned. Again, if you remember, 448A is a 404A like refrigerant that is non-flammable, used great for both medium temp and low temp applications. And with that not being SNAP approved for medium temp, I'll only lets you go to propane or what we talked about was an A2L, which is a mildly flammable refrigerant. We have strong indications that in fact A2Ls might be the future because in terms of GWP level, it's below 500 and therefore that that might actually be an acceptable use. But for now, we're still waiting for an understanding on what A2Ls will in fact be approved uh, for medium temp applications or medium back pressure refrigerant like 404A. Okay, Ronnie, this one's probably gonna be for you. Can you go over one more time the buffet unit compliance portion, specifically the portion that covered what needs to be compliant and what does not fall into any DOE category? Sure, uh, if you remember, if we back, back up to that chart where we talked about uh, buffet tables and construction, it's really about how this refrigeration condensing unit is being shared with the top rail and the bottom storage of the system. If you are using a solenoid valve with actual run times, there is in fact a DOE test procedure that will allow you, that will in fact require uh, some kind of a kilowatt hour mandate and therefore that you are regulated. It's for those systems that you are sharing a condensing unit between the top rail and bottom storage without the strict controls of a solenoid valve that is going to the top and the bottom. The other two, the first one, which means with the condensing unit on the bottom, therefore it's just classified as an undercounter and there's a test procedure for that and there's a kilowatt hour mandate. And the second class of equipment, on the top rail it would be treated independently as an open display case or, or, or a deli case. And then your bottom storage would again be another undercounter. So those are in fact regulated. It depends on the architecture and as Brian mentioned, um, as well that we are also here to help. We have technical experts in our third-party lab that can help you navigate some of these uh, classes of equipment that don't need, in fact, regulations and a kilowatt hour mandate. Okay, Brian, I think this is this one's for you. It relates to slide 13. Can we go back to that slide? Um, so for smaller VCT, sounds like propane makes a lot of sense given efficiency improvements needed. I'm sorry, could you repeat what's, what's the question? Is? For smaller VCTs, sounds like propane makes a lot of sense given efficiency improvement. Oh, oh sure. I, I think the choice of refrigerant can be one of the significant design options for small pieces of equipment. And, and as Ani tried to you know, point out, you have to really take into account both the future DOE and EPA requirements for this equipment. We do see a lot of uh, small self-contained uh, merchandisers, you know, already moving to the, the very low GWP refrigerants like propane, uh, and, and we expect that trend, trend to continue. I mean, if you think about it as well, uh, just in the choice of propane, it's a great thermodynamically re performing refrigerant with capacity, and we're seeing almost up to 15% in efficiency gain on our condensing unit. And typically on a rule of thumb, it's again, a rule of thumb is about 50 to 60% of what we're seeing on a condensing unit translate to an actual energy in terms of kilowatt hours. So therefore, we're seeing 15% improvement on a condensing unit, 7.5% of that can actually be attributed to the actual system itself. Propane is a great option, no doubt. Great. Um, are remote ice machines going to be affected sooner than self-contained ice machines? Well, I, I guess it depends on what the, rem the remote ice making head is connected to. If it's connected to a supermarket piece of equipment, it would typically, you know, fall under under those guidelines. For example, you know, in a supermarket, if you have an ice making head connected up to the supermarket parallel rack, uh, you would not be able to continue using 404A deep, you know, long into the future for that. What would what would dictate the choice of refrigerant for that piece of equipment would be the supermarket requirements. But as far as the DOE is concerned, both remote and self-contained ice machines are impacted starting January of 2018. Okay, great. Um, Ani, um, if someone's saying they're replacing a failed condensing unit, is that considered a retrofit? 
Yeah, so so it depends on what lens we're talking about. In a in an EPA front, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but it basically we're looking at any time a retrofit increases the capacity levels or the architecture of compression is when it's considered retrofit and new. Therefore, you're impacted by the EPA regulations. But if you're just replacing a condensing unit like for like and repairing it with the same capacity draw um, that you need, that is not considered a retrofit. That is considered a replacement. And aftermarket service, you are not affected by these EPA regulations. This is only for new pieces of equipment. So you can continue to service with 404 or 134. Okay. Is Emerson looking into making condensing units for R450 or R513A that have BTU capacity greater than 8,000 BTUs and still be able to keep footprint similar to current 404 R404A models? Are yes, you sir. Um, for the last two years, we've been working um, as an organization in order to be compliant for not only DOE regulations but for EPA requirements. The answer to your question is yes. The entire condensing unit portfolio that Emerson Climate Technologies offers will now will be offered as new systems, a new condensing unit starting in January of 2017 that will in fact be not only rated for 455.13 for those capacities, but also for 448A and 449A as well as propane. We're kind of in the all of the above options in order providing our equipment manufacturers what they need. Okay. There is an application um, with SNAP right now to raise the max propane charge, or is uh, maybe this person's asking, is there an application in SNAP right now to raise the max propane charge to one kilogram? That has been discussed in Europe, and that's probably where that question is coming from. Uh, they are uh, probably further along with, you know, application of R290 in Europe and uh, uh, more pieces of equipment are using it. it. As far as we know in the United States right now, it's going to be 150 gram limit for a while for these pieces of equipment. But there certainly are discussions and a lot of people that would like to see uh, that charge limit increased uh, as long as it can be done safely. Okay, I think we have time for one more. So with a AWF requirements, this relates to that. Does this apply only to walk-in refrigeration, your one-on-one -on -one systems, versus a compressor serving, se serving several vertical refrigerators multiplexed? Yeah, and that's a, that's a question we get pretty often because there are manufacturers of um, uh, condensing units that, you know, do, do service multiple fixtures. And as, as we understand it right now, and Ani can correct me if I'm wrong, the, uh, the uh, AWF applies basically to one-to-one -one condensing units. And a, a, a modulating condensing unit or one that can serve as mul multiple efficiency, uh, multiple evaporators uh, would, would, would not be considered under the, would not Correct. be rated under the AWF. Yeah. Basically, if there's multiple suction groups for one digital condensing unit, a digital compression with modulating technology, or in fact, a uh, variable speed is probably is not accounted. Okay, great. Um, so that's all we have the time we have for questions today. Thank you all on the call for your participation, as well as Brian and Ani. As a reminder, within approximately 24 hours after this live event, you can access this presentation on demand at emersonclimate.com backslash E360 hyphen webinars. And you'll also receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the recorded event. On behalf of Emerson, thank you for attending today's E360 webinar. We hope you can join us for our upcoming November 29th webinar, Making Sense of the Latest Rulemaking on Acceptable Refrigerants, with presenters from Emerson, Arkema, Camores, and Honeywell, for an insightful discussion on the recent SNAP rulings and the status of new refrigerant availability. Thank you all.